A few weeks ago, I re-evaluated the very first card in the Why Nobody Plays series, Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon, and you guys seem to really enjoy it, because basically what happened is that I noticed that many of the things that I brought up in that original Blue Eyes Chaos Max video sort of changed over a couple years. Things like Bingo Machine Go and Incantations truly did make the Chaos Max strategy much more viable, so I thought doing an update video was an excellent way to sort of modernize my opinions on Chaos Max Dragon. Because you guys responded so well to that video I thought I would do the exact same thing for every single card in why nobody plays and this is really cool and I don't have nearly as much to talk about with all of these cards individually as I did with chaos max dragon so I'm gonna put all of them in one video but basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be going through every single why nobody plays card that I've reviewed anyway without further ado let's talk briefly about chaos max dragon now the big thing about chaos max dragon that changed was the incantations the incantations cards are super strong for really any ritual deck but especially chaos max the biggest problem with chaos max is that it couldn't play pre-preparation of rights and it still can't play pre-preparation of rights if that ever changes the deck might be a little bit more viable than it is right now but right now you can at least play the incantations and that really does make a pretty big difference it adds a ton of searching capabilities to your deck i've talked about all of this in that previous video which i'll link in the description below but basically if you don't want to watch that video the big difference here is the incantations What's funny about the Dark Bribe video is that before that video, I mean years before that video, Dark Bribe actually was a competitively viable card. However, when I made that video, no one was really playing that card outside of people that weren't very competitive, but a couple months later with some new releases, people actually started playing this card in side decks. Even I played one copy of this card in a side deck for I think two different events, and basically what happened is that trap decks needed an out to cards like Twin Twisters and Red Reboot and Evenly Match, and while Wiretap was a significantly better counter to things like Evenly Match and Red Reboot, the problem was, and I found this as well, is that when you sided Wiretap against decks like Goki and decks that didn't play a lot of trap cards outside of Evenly Match and Red Reboot, oftentimes, or like half the time at least, your opponent just wouldn't draw a Red Reboot. They wouldn't draw the Evenly Match, and now you have this dead card against the rest of their cards. This was was especially painful when your opponent used a twin twister and you had that wiretap and you're thinking well if only they would have had the red reboot I would have had the perfect counter but what made dark bribe so good was that even if your opponent didn't draw the specific cards like red reboot or evenly match you still had a pretty useful card against the rest of their deck you could hit a goki rematch or a monster reborn or a soul charge or a twin twisters in some cases however I still think that wiretap is a better card and specifically as we move forward most people dropped Dark Bribe from their side decks, and we're specifically talking about decks like True Dracos and Altergeist and Frogs that were sort of experimenting with Dark Bribe, but Wiretap just ended up being way better against other stun decks. I think that personally, when I played Dark Bribe instead of one copy of Wiretap, I noticed that when I played those stun deck mirror matches, quote unquote mirror matches, I guess they're not technically mirror matches, but when you play the other slower strategies, Dark Bribe was significantly, significantly worse than Wiretap because in those matchups you're really trying to get the most value as possible where Dark Bribe is more of a tempo card. It's a minus in card economy because your opponent gets a free card to replace what you just negated. However, in the matchups where the main thing you're worried about are cards like Evenly Match and Red Reboot, it is helpful to have a sort of all counter to those types of cards. To no one's surprise, Magic Cylinder has not become any more competitive since I made that original Why Nobody Plays Magic Cylinder video. It is maybe worth mentioning that it saw some experience experimentation in a few Trickstar decks, but realistically those were few and far between and just didn't really make a huge impact on the competitive landscape. Magic Cylinder is one of those cards that would make a huge difference if it was added to Duel Links and obviously has its spot in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. I mean, back in the day the card was very strong, however, even with decks like Trickstars, which are sort of a burn deck, I mean, they're not really a burn deck, but they sort of do burn damage, that's a pretty big aspect of that strategy, even with that deck being a a huge force in competition, Magic Cylinder never really took off. Card Trader is pretty much still terrible. I don't even think there's like a semi-viable way to use this card. I eventually did a video on Magical Mallet, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here, but as far as Card Trader goes, yeah, the thing never really saw competitive play. It's still bad for every single reason that I mentioned in that video. Out of all of the Why Nobody Plays videos, maybe not more than the Egyptian God Card video, the Card Trader one is the one that has aged the most 
gracefully just because all the things I said in that video are still true to this day. The same can basically be said with Jar of Greed, although I do have two interesting insights from making that video. The first one is that, and this is very long before I made any videos about Pot of Greed, is that I got a ton of comments on that video that says no one knows what it does, which is funny to me because that entire meme is only centered around Pot of Greed, at least to my knowledge. I don't think there's a meme revolving Jar of Greed, but people that haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh in a lot of years, maybe don't know what Pot of Greed looks like, they sort of thought in some ways and I'm sure some of the comments were memeing but I think a lot of those comments legitimately didn't know the difference between pot of greed and jar of greed so if you go on that video you'll see a ton of comments from people that very clearly think the card is pot of greed also and this is sort of an add-on to that video that I wish I would have put in it a lot of people mentioned that legacy of Yadagaratsu is a strict upgrade from jar of greed and I failed to mention that in that original analysis the reason it's a strict upgrade is that it only has a bonus upside. It has no difference in the main effect, and while your opponent probably won't be playing Spirit Monsters, when you're looking at a card that only has an extra upside that sometimes works, yeah, that means you basically never would play Jar of Greed unless you were already playing three copies of Legacy of Yadagaratsu. This is something that I talked about in the past when I did discussion videos on cards like Twister, which don't really ever see play anymore, because if you were going to play a card like Twister, you would already have to be playing Mystical Space Typhoon and Twin Twisters and Cosmic Cyclone, there's just not enough room in someone's deck for all of those cards, so Twister doesn't really see a lot of play, and I think the same thing can be said for Jar of Greed. Why would you ever play this card when better cards exist? But more importantly, even if you were going to play Jar of Greed, you might as well play three copies of Legacy of Yadagaratsu, and I can't really think of a deck that would want to play six total copies of a draw one trap card. I'm legitimately surprised how many views the Why Nobody Plays Sparks video got it was mostly just to celebrate hitting 25,000 subscribers. However, I did have a sort of interesting discussion in that video that I think really showcased how the difference in mindset between casual and competitive players was. And basically what I was talking about is how much attack or defense a level four vanilla monster would have before it saw competitive play. Now, obviously in the past, level four vanilla monsters have seen play if they had like 1,800 or 1,900 attack points. But what I was talking about in that video was was how much attack in modern Yu-Gi-Oh would a vanilla monster have to have without any archetype attachments that any other like combo cards. We're not talking about Gem Knight Garnet here. We're just talking about a normal vanilla monster with no outside support. Obviously you could summon it with Rescue Rabbit and this other sort of generic normal support. But in general, that's what I spent the vast majority of that video talking about. And I still don't think there's a good answer. The reason there's not a good answer is because Konami would never release a 4,000 attack level four vanilla monster even if that's what it would take for that card to be sort of competitively viable. What a lot of people seem to miss or misunderstand is that normal monsters, even if they have a lot of attack points, they're not combo cards, they're not starter cards, and it makes it really hard to evaluate how much attack a card would have to have without any effect to actually see competitive play. So if you want to see more discussions like that, go check out that video. I know it wasn't mostly about sparks, but I just think it's kind of interesting to think about what would Konami have to do for a vanilla monster to to actually see play in 2018 or 2019 without any outside support. Sort of along the same lines as Chaos Max Dragon, I think at this point I've said everything there needs to be said about the Egyptian God cards. The only sort of new advancement to these cards and the only new success out of these cards is that Jesse Cotton did make a top eight place at a regional qualifier playing one copy of each of them. It's worth mentioning though, and the reason I didn't do a video on that was because in that profile he said it was a joke, he said they were bricks, he said they were terrible. It was just a meme that he did at a regional qualifier. It wasn't a serious thing. I think most people understood that, but I still did get tagged in a lot of posts like, here you go, Doug, you're proved wrong. They must have not watched the deck profile where he said it was a joke and said they were terrible. I don't really know how that happened, but basically he just played those cards as sort of a meme and people took it, some people, not all people, but some people took it seriously and thought it was disproving that entire video. But overall, I think outside of that one particular case in the 
hands of one of the best players playing the best deck of the format, the Egyptian God cards are still terrible and likely will always be terrible unless they get some crazy support in the future. The Sacred Beasts have actually been thrown in the limelight a little bit more since that Why Nobody Plays video way back in the day, specifically because they were on the mats for the recent YCS Atlanta 3v3 event, of which I chose Uriah, which is also the thumbnail of the Sacred Beast video and also probably the most competitive Sacred Beast, saw some experimentation in trap monster decks. But overall, I don't have a ton to add to Sacred Beast discussion. I will say that a point of contention for a lot of viewers was that I said that the Sacred Beast were better de designed versions of the Egyptian God cards. I said that mostly around their summoning conditions. I felt it was a lot easier to bring those guys out than it was the Egyptian God cards. Not even necessarily related to the fact of the continuous spells or continuous traps in the case of Haman and Uriah, but mostly related to the fact that they're special summons, not normal summons, which makes a huge difference. When you make an Egyptian God card deck, you really, really have to go out of your way to not only summon three monsters, but also do that without using a normal summon, or at least in the case of Sacred Beasts, you can use some crazy combos and then special summon them, so your normal summon is still reserved for starting off those crazy combos. When I posted the Wicked God card video, I actually received very few negative comments, probably the least amount of negative comments out of any of the Why Nobody Plays videos. However, the one negative comment that I seemed to get a couple sort of vocal minority people yelling about was the fact that I missed or quote unquote wasn't smart enough to realize that the Wicked Gods were created as direct counters to the Egyptian Gods. And here's the deal with that. While I understand that the Yu-Gi-Oh lore is important to a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh fans, in my Why Nobody Plays videos, and actually in the vast majority of all the videos that I post, I don't really care about the lore that much. I'm analyzing them from a competitive standpoint and talking about how good they are at tournaments or how successful they were at tournaments. And as far as the Wicked God cards go, and as far as gameplay goes, those cards are really, really bad counters to the Egyptian gods. They're just as inconsistent to summon and to make use of in your deck. And why would you ever bother putting direct counters to god cards when the god cards are already super unpopular? Even if you knew you were going up against the Egyptian god cards, there are a thousand other options that you can use to deal with them that are much better than the wicked gods. Things like Dark Hole or Mirror Force or Borolo Dragon, if you're looking at more modern cards, are all better options for dealing with the Egyptian god cards than the wicked god cards, just because the wicked god cards have the same issues as the Egyptian gods in that they take three tributes and they're inconsistent, they break your hands. So no, I didn't mention that in that video because I felt like it didn't matter and I still sort of stand by that opinion. Sort of along the same lines of the card trader discussion, I think the Magical Mallet video actually mostly stays true. No one really topped with Magical Mallet after I made that video. It did see some play in Spellbook decks, which I mentioned in that discussion. Mostly I did that video to sort of compare and contrast what makes Magical Mallet on paper better than Card Trader, but still not good enough to see play. I also added on to this discussion a little bit later when I talked about how when Magical Mallet was added to Duel Links as a skill, it suddenly became a lot more competitive. And I think that goes to show that Magical Mallet type effects, the mulligan type effects are good in Yu-Gi-Oh, just not when they take an extra card out of your hand. So Magical Mallet, if it drew one extra card compared to what you put back, would be a lot more competitive, actually very competitive. But the fact that it's a minus one actually kills this card competitively. I think I covered my thoughts on Exodia the Forbidden One really well in the commenters don't understand Exodia video. The main thing that I had to add on to the discussion was that yes, Exodia did get an OTS top like a week after I posted that video, but what a lot of people didn't understand, I think this is sort of along the same lines as the Jesse Cotton Egyptian God card thing, is that I'm sure like half the people understood that it was a joke and half people didn't, but basically a lot of people didn't seem to understand that an OTS championship is literally just a local tournament with like 30 people, so no, Exodia topping that quote unquote didn't actually mean anything just because it was such a small event. Overall though, yeah, Exodia is a fun sort of win condition, it is an iconic card, I even tried my my, to throw my hat in and make my best possible Exodia list that I thought at the time was pretty consistent if your opponent didn't have any hand traps, of course. But that deck unfortunately got hit on the ban list sort of indirectly by Striker getting hit. But overall, I still think that if you're trying to play Exodia, that Sky Striker Exodia list, well, it doesn't play that many Sky Striker cards. But the Exodia list that I posted a few months back still, for the most part, works fairly decently if your opponent doesn't have a hand trap or any negations. And if you're trying to play Exodia, that's probably the best way to do it. I didn't really mention any of the bad Exodia traps or spells or all those sort of weird pieces of support. I 
I think those are more oriented towards casual play. And as I've sort of mentioned, and you guys know, this is a competitive analysis channel. Looking back on it, the why nobody plays your favorite Yu-Gi-Oh deck video feels kind of out of place. It probably shouldn't have been part of the why nobody plays series because that series isn't really about the sort of general discussion I did in that video. The main reason I made that video is because all the time I get asked at events, why does no one play? And then they say like their favorite rogue strategy. So I wanted to make one singular video to sort of answer those questions. I think where this video should have fit is like the Yu-Gi-Oh analysis for beginners playlist. And I would have had to title it a little bit differently. Overall, I think that was the biggest miss of the Why Nobody Plays series, but I don't really have anything to add to the discussion. The discussion was good. It's just not really like a Why Nobody Plays video, but I just want to mention that in here, it is technically a Why Nobody Plays installment, but it doesn't really feel like the other ones in the series. A lot of people, and I really mean a lot of people, were very mad that I said Montage Dragon was better than the Egyptian God cards. And I get it, the Egyptian God cards have a lot more text, they have a lot more effects, but I truly think if you tried to build a deck around the Montage Dragon strategy or the Egyptian God card strategy, you'd find more success with Montage Dragon. Even though it doesn't have like any crazy effects like the Egyptian God cards do and they actually hit the field, I think the card overall is just a lot more consistent and a lot stronger than the Egyptian God cards, especially in terms of how easy it is to summon, which I tried talking about in that video as well as the Sacred Beast video and said that they're easier to summon the Egyptian God cards. Overall, I think that Montage Dragon will probably never see competitive play, but I think it's more likely to see competitive viability than the Egyptian God cards, simply because it's so much easier to summon. And the Egyptian God cards, if we're being completely honest here, they don't have any protection effects either. I mean, Obelisk does, but overall, those cards, their protection effects as far as when they're normal summoned or special summon, those don't really matter in 2019. People aren't playing bottomless. People aren't playing Torrential Tribute, which means that Montage Dragon just has all upside. It's easier to summon. It still doesn't have protection, just like the Egyptian God cards. It's not any worse, but it has a lot higher attack points in most situations, and it actually has potential to kill your opponent in a quick OTK. Anyway, though, hope you guys enjoyed today's discussion video reviewing every single Why Nobody Plays card. I know I haven't done a new installment in this series in a couple months now, I think three or four months. I will have some more videos for this series planned. They just take a lot of work and a lot of sort of finesse. I think it's really important to analyze these cards properly with the proper mindset. It takes a little while to sort of script out what I want to talk about and actually put it into a video context. Anyway, though, I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Goodbye.